It's, it's an honor to be here. I'm just delighted to see all of you and I welcome you to Nebraska. I want to remind you that even though it's snowing outside, you are where it's happening. We've been on the national news for several days. So you are right in the heart of what's happening in the world. I wanted to tell you a little bit about myself and about the background of, I, I wanted to tell you about a moment in, I think it was 1986, I was standing in the parking lot of the Nebraska State Quilt Guild with Sarah Dillow, and we were talking about, wouldn't it be wonderful if there was a quilt museum in Nebraska? And now here we are 20 years later, 20 some years later, and it is so much more than we had ever envisioned or had ever thought about. Um, I came into this university setting, as many of you did, kind of through the back door, and I also came into quilting the same way. My educational background had nothing to do with all of the multidisciplinary things that we've been talking about. It had nothing to do with history, anthropology, art, graphics, women's studies, education, math or textiles, and quilts have everything to do with that. Likewise, my quilting background had nothing to do with quilting. I came, my, my, it includes a mother who got hives when she had to put in a hem, and, her, and my mother's generation who thought that, ha that handmade meant homemade. That was the period of time when quilting was kind of in its, it, it was quietly lying in the hinterland here in America. And then a window opened for me. It was during the American Bicentennial, and I read a women's art, an article in a woman's magazine about a look at women's history and about the resurgence of quilting as an example of connections between the generations of women. See, I was already figuring out that it was multidisciplinary. And I had already been through all of the, all of the fads, of the crafts of the months, including macrame and decoupage, all those things that we did in the 60s. But that article struck a chord for me, and it opened a window, and I've been passionately connected with quilting for the last 30 years. So today I want to talk about windows and doors. So I do want to talk about windows and doors, that is, insights and opportunities, and I want to provide a window for you on what quilting, quilting culture looks to, to us who are the practitioners of the, in this renaissance of quilting. I have, my research is empirical, it's very unscientific, it's about my own experiences. But I think that I'm pretty typical of the American quilters and the quilt teachers of this generation. We have created our own history in the last 30 years, and I've been a part of that for, as, as a learner and as a teacher, almost from the beginning of that. So from this grassroots point of view, I want to examine these four questions. Who are the teachers? Who are we teaching? What are we teaching and how are we teaching? Now, I've been doing this, an informal survey for the last year. I've asked those qu four questions of several regional and national teachers that I know, and I've also talked with some passionate quilt students, and I'll include their observations with mine. First of all, who are the teachers? And the other questions there, how did we learn, and why do we teach, and who will teach the next generation? First of all, the teachers. The traveling teachers are road warriors, as we call ourselves, or maybe on the workshop circuit, you've heard that term. We come from all backgrounds, and the basic criteria seems to be passion for quilting and the ability to lift full suitcases of quilts in a single bound. <laughs> I, all of you who have done this know that. How did we learn? Some of us had, some had degrees in education and in art or in home ec or other related disciplines, but most of us learned informally. And we learned to quilt in many different ways and came into teaching it from many different reasons. I learned from my mentor and friend, Lois Gotch, who taught a sampler quilt class in my neighborhood. And I also learned from my quilt Bible, the only book that was available at that time, which was Beth Gutchins, Perfect Patchwork Primer. Do any of you remember that book? It was, it, it was the Bible, it was what we lived by, and it was pre-rotary cutting days. And then one time, some years ago, I have to tell this little story, I saw Yvonne Porcella on a television show holding up a little yellow thing that looked like a pizza cutter. And she said it was going to change our lives, and she was absolutely right. Um, I learned also, like many other quilt teachers, from taking many, many classes from other quilt teachers who were steps ahead of me. The very first workshop that I took was in the 1970s. I left meals in the fridge for my family and I, every, directions for every possible disaster. 
I drove in a snowstorm, something like today, all the way to Kansas City, which was 200 miles away. The teacher was someone from the West Coast. Her name was Jean Ray Lowry. Our task was to design something and work it in felt. After crying in the bathroom for a while, <laughs> because I was not an artist and I had no art background and I had flunked art in high school, the art teacher told me, you know, you really should find something else. I sat at the table in the classroom looking at the floor and then Jean opened a window for me. It was a true insight. She said, look at what is around you. Look to see your surroundings with purposeful eyes. This is my piece. It was taken from the carpet in the hotel ballroom. <laughs> and that momentary insight stayed with me all these years along with this little felt piece and it has opened a door to many experiences. I wasn't learning to sew, I was learning to see and that was the piece that I took home from that workshop. How do we teach, why do we teach? There are many reasons that we teach and they come to it from all over, from many disciplines, from many things. I would say that for the majority we teach because we're passionate about it. We have something that we like to do and we want to share it. Secondly, there's the economic issue. That is to earn a living for a lot of people. And now this is a much harder part of this. Some do earn a living at it. A lot of them are do it as a secondary income. Um, it, if they can work full time at it, if they can have something else to sell along with their, work, along with their um, classes that they teach, and I would say something about that. Um, I've talked to some of the quilt students that are taking these workshops and what they dislike is to have a teacher come to class and expect their students to buy a lot of products, a lot of things that they're selling. But it can be done with, in a different, if it doesn't take time from their, workshop, from their workshop time and also if the student is allowed to say, yes, I want to buy that or no, I don't want to buy that. So that part of it, I understand that the teachers need to sell these project, products to increase their income, but I also think that they need to have a certain amount of generosity and a spirit of sharing that goes along with that. The other part of that is that it is really a, a very demanding time uh, field. It's a lot of time spent away from home and spent away from family. The, other th the third thing is the performance factor. And you know, you can't underestimate the lure of being asked to express your opinion in front of a group of people whose opinions you respect. Um, I want to go back a little bit to the teaching and how, uh, to the learning and how we have learned. As I said, I had taken workshops from a number of workshop teachers and later I took others. I took uh, workshops on fabric dyeing. What it said to me is that I don't want to do that. It's like cooking and I never know how it turns out. But we are very fortunate to have talented speech dyers and fabric designers. They are creating the palette that we are using. Um, I even peeked at once at, uh, textile, at textile science. I took a workshop from Dr. Cruz. We learned how to burn fabric to tell what its content was. I'm glad someone's doing it. I'm glad it's not me. But <laughs> I also understand how important that is for those of us who are actually do the practitioners that we're doing, the, the, um, we're using the batting that they are designing and we are able to then to have a, re a good answer for that question that comes every time we te speak at a guild. The first question that a quilter asks is, what kind of batting are you using? I also learned from visiting museums such as the Smithsonian, the DAR, and the Shelburne in Vermont. Um, those were areas where for a long period of time our quilts were being stored as a record of our history. I also visited a lot of art museums looking at it from quilters eyes and I can tell you a little story. I have a nine-year-old granddaughter, took her to the Denver Museum last month and as we walked through the rooms, the big new art museum, I said, you know, what do you think about that shape? What's your favorite color? What line is that? And she looked at me and she said, you're looking for ideas for your quilts, aren't you? <laughs> she was right, but I was also leaving her a legacy. Her legacy for me is not going to be the quilts. It's going to be being able to see in a different way the things that she, that she will see, encounter in her life. Um, I pe the history of quilts in quilt making is another broad area of interest for all of us who are coming from the grassroots. This is important work and I am so glad that our history is being recorded and preserved 
here at IQSC and also by quilt historians in groups like the Quilt Study Group and museums across the country. I draw from this record whenever I want to design a, a traditional quilt. I'm not particularly interested in that research as such, and I do participate by collecting antique quilts and artifacts because I need them and they have, need a good home. And I've also been aware that quilting spills over into other disciplines. In the 80s, I was attending a summer session at St. Joseph's College in Maine, and the professor in our cultural anthropology class had an informal seminar where students were reading the papers that they had written. He was much more interested in that quilt that I was hand-piecing than he was in the paper that I had carefully written about the pioneer families of western Nebraska. So my, it, it crosses all disciplinary lines, and I know that I'm speaking to the choir here because all of you understand that. My point is that there is something for everyone, and grassroots quilt teachers have many areas to explore and many ways to learn. And I have used these insights to encourage the women in my classes to open their eyes and minds, to see what's around them, and to find their quilt passion. And thank goodness we all have different interests or we'd all be making, cranking out the same little quilt. Who will teach next? Much has been said this weekend about credentials. Um, I hope that we will have teachers who can give us the skills to practice our art in whatever quilt discipline we choose. And I, but I do also hope that it doesn't get so formalized that there is no one hauling a trunk show from guild meeting to guild meeting sharing what kind of batting we use. I look at our quilt teaching, our workshop teaching, as maybe the doorway for some of our students to come to you, the academics, to take it further and go on farther with it. Um, I see the work, this is a commentary about the work of the teachers. I see the work of the teachers as opening windows uh, in an accessible way for the informal education of these students. I want to tell you a story about a guild in Louisiana. They decided to include an art quilt class in their symposium for the two, first time. It was going to be a two-day workshop with Nancy Halpern. And the organizers had trouble convincing the guild members that they too could make an art quilt and also to spend two days in the same class with the same teacher. I was there teaching a more traditional class, and as Nancy's students came out of that class, they were absolutely fired about what they had learned and about their experience. They couldn't believe that they had actually made art. The concept continued to grow, and three years later, I was invited back to teach a more design-oriented workshop, and the art class teacher there was Michael James. He brought a much more formal approach to art quilts, and those quilters were ready for it. And obviously, he taught about the character of a line, because, the, because that evening, his students presented a, a skit. It was a chorus line. There were women representing straight lines, broad lines, wiggly lines, <laughs> curvy. I liked the curvy lines. No, I liked the wiggly line one better. They were all dancing to music and having a wonderful time. No picture I could show you would do that justice. But your middle picture says it all. But what I'm what my point is that that window on quilting and art quilting and camaraderie will stay with all of us. And it just may have opened a door for someone to keep on making art through quilts. And now I'm using art in the concept, uh, in the context of doing something that expresses one's own ideas, not necessarily with a formal art vocabulary or meant to hang in a gallery. Accessibility is the uh, next thing on there. In the future, we can look to a more formal approach to quilt education with teachers who have been formally educated and credentialed in all disciplines taught here and in other places. But for now, our practical hands-on approach has been a way to broaden and enrich the experience of quilt makers. Um, I hope that accessibility will continue to be considered. That is, for the non-traditional student, access to classes, to the collections, and the knowledge base for non-traditional students and for the grassroots teachers. Until now, this university has included our community in every possible way, and I'd really like to see that continue. And the third thing that teachers, uh, the work of the teachers is fun. For most of our students, quilting is an avocation, and they should expect to have a good time when they come to our classes. I can tell you that chocolate helps. <laughs> Who are we teaching? Mostly women. I've had three men in my classes in all these years, and I'm not apologizing for that. I would like to see it, I would like to see the, it change a little bit, but for the most part, we do think of it as women's, as women's uh, quote, work, but I would say as, as a women's connection as well. Um, 
I think also there may be a lot of men who are closet quilters that just aren't comfortable with being seen with a needle in their hand. I have two sons who do know how to drive a sewing machine, but they will never admit it. Mostly the, our age has been middle age up until now, and it's wonderful to see all of the talk to this weekend about children and classes and bringing children into our quilt world. Uh, women from all economic, social, and work backgrounds. I would say though on an economic level that this is not an inexpensive activity and so most have some disposable income and some leisure time. And I think that may lead to the fact that we're all getting a little bit gray. Many women are coming to our classes as they retire because now they finally have the time to do what they've always wanted to do. Most of the women in my classes have not been taught by mothers or grandmothers. They've come from that generation like mine where there was the gap in the quilting background. Many, many are using quilting as self-expression. They're more comfortable with a needle than with a paintbrush, and I would fall into that category. And then, of course, the sociability factor. They want to have fun, and they want to spend time together, and there's nothing wrong with that. We may all look alike. You may think that, and you may be right. Many years ago, I was dragging family members to a quilt show in Vermont, and we weren't sure of the location, but as we drove down the interstate, I saw a car with a gray-haired woman in a denim vest, and you know the rest of the story? <laughs> she led us straight to the quilt show. <laughs> now that woman is my hero. You will find her organizing quilt shows. You'll find her visiting her quilting friend in the hospital. You will find her spending hours as a volunteer at the Quilt Study, study Center here. She takes, joy, she takes joy in making wonderful traditional quilts, quite often in purple. And she is also a lifelong learner, and I would like to see her not left behind in, as we learn from every avenue. That woman is also the student who comes to our classes. She begins, she comes to the beginner class with a box of fabric scraps from sewing her clothing and her curtains, and she expects to make a king-size double wedding ring quilt for her daughter tomorrow. <laughs> uh, that's an inside joke among quilt teachers. Our quilt shops, I think, now are the best place for these beginners to learn. It's a place where they see into the window of possibility that's known as the stash. They learn how to use all of those, all of those tools that we are learning, that we are using, such as the rotary cutter, of course, and they know about a quarter inch seam allowance. The best quilt shops are those that provide an atmosphere of friendship and unconditional acceptance, and they open the door to the next step for the student, which is taking a workshop from a class or a class from a visiting teacher, and that's where I have been for a long time. The next step after our work, after us, would be coming to an academic setting, I think. But here in these classes is where students sort themselves into categories. This is an affectionate observation <laughs> of the students who come to my classes and to many of our workshops. There is the perfectionist. I once gave a kit in a beginner's class that included fabric to make four patches. One student called me three times in that week with questions about how to cut this fabric. Finally, I said, you know, it's just a piece of fabric. I'd, I'll give you another one if you do it wrong. The next week, she told me it was the best advice I could have given her. And I learned that I needed to write clearer directions. And I also learned that I needed to give her an out, another way to approach that dangerous forepatch so that she doesn't have to unsew, and, a fact, and to remind her that we don't give grades in these classes. The teacher's helper, I begin classes with a policy, um, with my own policy, that I expect to help every student, and I expect students to follow me around the room if they have a question. Too often, the person next to them is all too willing to help which interferes with her own class time and may be a different, not necessarily worse process than the one that I'm teaching. However, these people can be a big help if the, somebody's sewing machine misbehaves in class and it's beyond my expertise. So I think we owe these people who want to help us the respect of having from their previous um, experience, but we also need to control how much they interfere with the other ch students in the class. The sponge. This is the person who comes with some experience and or a personal vision. She wants to observe, she wants to learn, and she wants to apply it to her own work. It took me a while to, as a teacher to forgive myself 
when someone when this person walked out of the class without the piece that looked exactly like everyone else's. And then when I realized that this was also my own style of learning, I was able to tell the students that I also flunk workshops and I don't necessarily expect them to step to my tune, but I do want to know that they have gotten what they needed from that class. And here's where I value evaluations. They are great tools. I check with the students before they leave to see if they've learned at least one thing. That was something else I learned from Yvonne Porcella. Um, and even if that's that they will never do this again. And I value the written evaluations, re and I try not to take them personally. The first time I taught a class in Houston, I wanted to be very professional. So I spent hours putting together a slide presentation, a little bit like today. And then I got any, the evaluations back, and they all said I enjoyed it. Most of them said, we loved the class, but we could have done without the slides. <laughs> Good. Never had to do that again. The overachiever student is that is the person, you know, some students are just driven. To, they are driven to get it done, to finish, and they, and they may come to class with a lot more experience than the others have. Or they may just be caught up in the process and want to get it done. But they may also be under pressure to show their husbands how much they have accomplished in that time away from home. And that there is that pressure with the women who come to our classes. Accounting for our time and for money spent is an underlying motivation for many of our students. But the overachiever does know that we are all allowed to boo in good-natured um, fun when she finishes her project. The last person on this list is the reluctant learner. This is the person with the attitude that I can't possibly have anything to offer her. Her arms are crossed and it appears as though her mind is closed. We as teachers need to give these adults permission to learn. They come to class feeling that they are adults and they should know, so they are taken by surprise when there's something when they don't know what's expected of them. <coughs> I talk about this in class as an expectation that the student leave the door open to learn something new and that they do have permission to do, to do that. What we are teaching, basics. Obviously, we need to know those basics, how to use all the tools and how to cut piece applique and quilt. These basic skills have usually been covered in classes at community colleges, shops, or with the help of a grandmother or auntie by the time they come to my classes. But what attracts a student to a workshop, seminar, lecture? That would be enrichment and tradition. We want to learn more. We started out with the basics. We want to learn more, and we want to add to our knowledge base. And we want to spend time with our friends. This could be the legacy of the quilting bee, the stitching together. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about tradition in a minute. Process and product. Uh, for a long period of time, teachers have been showing students how to replicate something that they have made. For example, a teacher may, uh, a quilter may have made a beautiful piece and won a prize in a quilt show, and then she starts teaching workshops to tell you how, uh, how she made that. Or she may have a recognizable style and teaches students to work in that style. Or she may have published a pattern or a book and she helps students make that pattern and coincidentally to buy that book. These are what I see as product classes. She comes to this class with a set idea of something she will make and expects to leave that class with the product in hand. Sitting and sewing are part of the package and so is hauling carloads of fabric. I believe that a good teacher starts with wanting to teach a process or a concept and designs that product to reflect that. The really sneaky teacher slips in a whole lot of process in the production of the product and the student doesn't realize until she's home that she really learned a lot more than how to make a table runner. She may walk out with her table runner but she also knows how to cut a thousand triangles in 15 minutes or how to make those stars pop because of color contrast. We are seeing changes now in what students expect from workshops and classes. They are more sophisticated in what they know and what they want to learn. A process class is more likely to fill now than it was a few years ago. Technical things like machine quilting, fabric printing, and hand applique are popular. But so is color theory and fabric dyeing and original design. Students are happily leaving class with a set of their own hand dyed fabric or a set of 3,000 different machine stitches or notes on the character of a line with a vision of doing their own product. Teaching a concept or a theory is much more beneficial to our students in the long run. I've written four quilting how-to books and by far the most successful was the one without a single pattern in it. It taught how to design and execute borders on a quilt. The classes that were based on that book were also the most satisfying. It was a running dialogue on design with students bringing their own projects for discussion and advice. We operated under the principle of free advice, freely given and freely used or ignored. 
Here's where working with adult learners is so fulfilling. Respect for their past experience leads to some pretty exciting results. A uh, little word about teaching process versus product. I think we have a window here to encourage and develop a greater appreciation for the process of quilt making. The headline buzzwords in quilt magazines and books now are fast, quick, easy. Look at the covers and you will see those on everything. And that is good for some product projects. It certainly it fits into the time frame of our lifestyle, but it is also wonderful, something wonderful about the creative flow and meditative quality of the actual making of a quilt that is special. When my son was planning a wedding, his fiancée came to our house to help plan her wedding quilt. And she asked me if I didn't get tired of sewing all the time. She really surprised me. It took me by surprise. Um, I never really thought of it as sewing. I had to think about it for a while, what I was really doing, and I can't quite define it yet, but maybe it was joy in the process. Or maybe it was just that intrinsic satisfaction of a creative endeavor. Now she's educated. She doesn't ask that question anymore, and her little girl is learning to use my machine. Um, even though these areas move beyond what we've traditionally thought of as quilt classes, they still have roots in our traditions. I have a dark antique scrap quilt, which is one of the best examples I can think of for teaching the principle of color value. These stars move forward and back, disappear and reappear based on the placement of color value. It make, the quilt itself makes the concept accessible to all of us who are informally educated. And I like to think that the quilter who made this was aware of what she was doing. That's my own revisionist history, and I was taught by Mary Gormley that you can make up stories about the quilter because we don't have any history from her. And the fourth thing uh, that I think is the rule that teachers should teach is empowerment. Making quilts for self-expression is not instinctive. We are given, giving the, our students the tools and the skills to the, so that they can make, can make this art, quote, as well as they possibly can. How are we teaching? Quilt shows, always a staple for the, from international to local ones. I went to an international quilt show in New York one time in 1986, and it was the first time that I saw quilts from Japan. A group of Japanese quilt, quilt students were there, and they talked about their apprentice style of learning at that time. The quilts were a grand reflection of the taste and the color sense of that culture, and also it was a wonderful cultural exchange, exchange for us and part of the history of our generation of quilt learning. And in this genre, I would also include show and tell. We learn so much from each other, both about what works and what doesn't work, and one of the joys of quilting is that, under, that unconditional acceptance that a quilter feels when she stands in front of her guild to show her latest cre creation. It's like, I did this, and everyone is appreciative of it. So we learn from that. Travel groups, cruises and tours are another way that quilters learn together. It's a viable to venue for teaching. The destinations often include quilt shows such as Japan and Europe and quilt meccas like the Quilt Study Center here in Lincoln. Often the itinerary is designed for class time and we are seeing non-quilting family members coming along and many friendships formed in the name of quilt learning. Competitions. Some of us respond to a question being, being posed and challenging ourselves to find a solution. For example, there were some spectacular pieces from the that resulted from expressions of freedom. It was the IQS-sponsored competition directed toward human rights. It was an opportunity, a doorway for quilters to explore their attitudes toward this important issue. Juried shows, which are competitions in a sense, in Houston and Paducah are getting better and better. Never underestimate the power, econo economic power. When monetary rewards became part of the quilting world, the quality of the work and the quality increased exponentially. We learned from seeing what has been done, from imagining what could be, and being rewarded for that vision. Printed material. Books and magazines are great resources for inspiration and are now readily available to most quilters. They are inherently transient and constantly demand new ideas and new formats. It's good to see that some that new fresh formats are being targeted toward new quilters and toward younger audiences. I'm personally kind of inspired by an article about quilting tattoos. Uh, as long as there are new people interested, there, there, is, there is a secondary thing for us. As long as new people are interested in quilting, there will be plenty of fabric available for the rest of us. And of course, the addition of DVDs to books means that you can have a demonstration right at home. Television, I'm going to go on here. Television, again, accessibility is the key. Everyone watches TV. Quilt teachers like Fonz and Porter, Eleanor Burns, and Alex Anderson are household words. 
I'm struck by the power of this media. Every time my one little segment on Simply Quilts reruns, I hear from people from everywhere. They see it and they hear it and they listen to it. And when I meet family members, husbands particularly, the first thing they say is, have you been on Simply Quilts? It's because that's where they, that's their common ground. Teaching lectures and entertainment extravaganzas. Several years ago, the Minnesota Guild decided it wanted to eliminate workshops in favor of teaching lectures for its members, teaching lectures. It was a good step. She said they, they said they didn't want to haul sewing machines anymore. They wanted to learn and take it home. So it was one which brought together the idea of the quilting bee sociability with building on a knowledge base. Mary Ellen Hopkins, Sharon Craig, Harriet Hargrave, and others have been offering this form of teaching for many years. And it's involved into the entertainment type of extravaganza such as offered by Ricky Timms. It's our spoonful of sugar con concept of teaching. We learn while we have fun, and we party with our friends with like interests. They're the modern day quilting bees. And of course the internet. Want to, want to learn a specific technique? Take a class at Quilters University Online. Want to find a teacher for your guild? Go to her website. Wonder about the origin of African mud cloth? cloth? Google it. Need a yard of a certain fabric? Try eQuilter.com. Want to chat with about your recent projects? Start a blog. As with everything else, quilting is online. I would, as an aside to that, I think that one of the effects of this instant communication is that it will be harder for future historians to place the origins of quilts. We used to recognize a regional influence. We could say, oh, that quilt came from the Amish in Indiana, or that one with, with the wider borders in proportion came from the Pacific Northwest, or that one is from the Baltimore area, that one's from Japan, the Netherlands, Australia. Now, with the instant communication, it will be a matter of that quilt came from that, has a fabric in it that was made in 2006. That one was from the 1990s, but they will all be from all the world of quilting. Dr. Cruz once commented that a scrap quilt is a great record for fa a fabric in existence at the time that the quilt was made. I think that will also be the way we'll be able to date quilts in the future. Seminars and symposia, I love this symposium because it always brings up so many new ideas, so many wonderful ways of connecting. These can be guild-sponsored or shop-sponsored. Quilters will travel to take classes from well-known teachers, especially if there is a show and a vendor mall connected. But some workshops and quilt guilds are not filling. I think books and TVs have made special, has made self-teaching more doable. Also, some of my teaching friends are finding that the traveling part is getting harder for them. It's the same story as any, in any traveling occupation. Those of you who flew in this weekend know about that. Air travel is costly and it's inconvenient. Quilts are hard to transport. As one friend of mine, Brenda, said, uh, you decide whether to share your quilts, you take as many safeguards as you can, and then you quit worrying about whether they'll make it through the baggage check. Yeah, but it is an issue for traveling quilt teachers. It's tempting to take slides with you and leave the quilts at home, but most quilters still prefer to look at that material artifact. They want to look at that quilt. They want to see the stitches. Um, and the travel teachers like to tell war stories. Our audience has been naive at times. Like one time I was asked whether or not they had to pay mileage for my return trip home. And I said, well, unless you want me to move in with you. But we're learning, and, we're, and, we have, and we have become much farther. I think it's the only industry in the world that expects teachers to stay in the homes of the people who have hired them. And it took us, some teachers still prefer that. They feel safer, and they like the connection. Other teachers really would like to have their own room and to be not on during that time. Uh, there can be great experiences and wonderful friendships forged. Uh, for example, a night on an ostrich farm in Illinois or a night on a game preserve in Florida, but there can also be interesting adventures. Try sharing the basement bedroom with two dogs and four mousetraps. <laughs> the goal now for uh, well-known is for teachers, quilt teachers, to seems to be to gain enough status to bring the quilters to the teachers. Um, after traveling to guilds, shows, and seminars, the more well-known teachers are hoping to set up a situation where the quilters can come to them. Um, I'd go to New England to take a class from Ruth McDowell or to Paducah to take a class from Carol Breyer Fallard. I'm hoping that the, under the aegis of the, inst of the institution here at the Quilt Study Center that it will bring teachers who are well known here and that people will come here for that. 
however the teaching is done. I see that there, there are certain responsibilities of a quilt teacher, whether from a scholarly or a back root, grassroots background. I don't have a slide for this, but I want to list them for you, one, two, three. First of all, to give the adult student permission to learn. Secondly, to look at process and product and, and see how it is that you're going to teach that. And thirdly, give, have ac you, to, the responsibility of the teacher is to offer access to a broader concept. That is, ways to see and experience and think that are wider than simply making a quilt. I've traveled around the world and I can always find a relationship to quilting. It doesn't have to be a quilt to see it through quilters' eyes. Um, I don't think that I would have, would I have ever known that that sunflower on the side of the road would do better if it had a complementary purple to go with its yellow if I hadn't done a, quilt, a color study for quilting. Would I have noticed that blueberries in a field in Maine have many shades and tones of blue? Would I have noticed the same Singer sewing machine in Zimbabwe that my mother-in-law used in western Nebraska? Would I have seen the shadows cast by two children in the Kalahari Desert if I hadn't looked at the effect of contrast in my quilts? Would I have been able to look out my north window and reflect what I see if I hadn't taken a workshop from Ruth McDowell? Or could I look out my south window and reflect what I see? I don't think so. And here's what I wish for my quilting students. The power to reflect their lives in their quilt making, the ability to do whatever it is that they want to do with cloth, even if it is still making that double wedding ring quilt for their daughter. And here, so that is one window on the grassroots quilt education. I asked my teaching friends to tell me what they see in the future. One saw technology in the form of a camera and a giant screen that would show her hands doing hand applique to the whole, to the whole class. Another worried that her style, which is antique reproductions, would become passe in favor of trendy, more modern looking quilts. And that could be a possibility if she doesn't also approach process as well as product. And another saw, her, saw the internet as her classroom, similar to the distance learning that is offered by so many universities. Here's what I guess would be the future. I see quilt education as multidisciplined, as we've talked about this morning, including studies, all the studies of conservation, textiles, history, geometry. I would have paid more attention in high school if I'd known quilting included geometry. Art, education, cultural studies, all of the things, museum studies, all the things that compose a quilt. I see it building on tradition with cultural interchange and open minds toward new ideas. I see it because I'm from Nebraska. I see it as concentrated here in Lincoln with international connections all over the world. And I see it with the door wide open for all who appreciate how the art of quilting can enrich their lives. I'm honored to have been here. Thank you for inviting me.